This is the Power to Podcast, show number seven zero. Might be looking at an iPad app together or taking a walk outside together. So that's really where it all starts is that type of engagement. And so having that student want to spend time with you. Welcome to a real world education with insight and advice from teachers in the game, where current and former educators reveal what truly sets apart the great teachers and what it takes to make a positive impact on students. Whether you're in pre-service learning, new to the game, or a seasoned veteran, this is the show for you. You'll leave feeling inspired to take action because we are powering education by empowering you. What's going on, everyone? This is Ken Herman, host of the Power to Podcast, and I'm here with my co-host, Mr. Matt Standard Definition Rogers. Matt, for two weeks, you tried a high-powered camera. You you looked fantastic. Your eyes were dreamy as I was I was editing, but it was it was coming up choppy. So to use that as an analogy, you're back in standard definition. What is a time in your class that you have tried? a lesson or a project or an activity with all the bells and whistles. And then afterwards you realize, you know what? I just got to cut it back to the, to the basics of what it was. Cause it was just better that way. The one that comes to mind is we were doing a VR activity and I rented out all the goggles from our school, you know, uh, mobile library. And even though I was connected to, you know, moving, the virtual reality and I could change and I could direct kids <laughs> the moment goggles went on. Uh, I, you know, it's hard enough without something cool and fascinating like uh, VR to, to get the kids focused to task. But the moment you put it on, it was really tough. So I started shifting all of my virtual reality experiences to one kid as a driver of the iPad and they would project their iPad to the screen. So everyone was vicariously living through that driver and every scene or every uh, opportunity, I would you know, swap out who was running or driving the scene so that it did get to everyone's hands, but it was less distracting and I felt like more impactful. But boy, oh boy, did I take some great photos and take credit for that immersive experience. What about you? You know, after I asked that question, one, I was very impressed how quickly you answered it because we, for those that don't know, we don't really plan anything, especially even our intro. So I threw that on to you <laughs> as we were recording here. And then as I was listening to your great answer, I came to the realization you're probably going to ask me and I'm drawing a total blank on a specific activity where I did way too much for absolutely no gain, but I can remember the feeling or the moments in my class where I had this grand idea. You know, I'll say the first time I did Genius Hour, I, I eventually, probably year three, I found a really good rhythm to Genius Hour, and I actually implemented it really successfully with my fifth graders to the point where I had kids actually write a short, a wrote a picture book where a student, where the intention was to tell a story, but also to learn how to speak Spanish. So they kind of learned how to speak Spanish in my class, and I don't know how. Um, but anyway, the first time I, I rolled out Genius Hour, I had this grand plan, and the wheels came spinning off after day two. And so, you know, those feelings of like you have this great idea. And I think it's also just as good as a teacher to realize that the ship is sinking and you just got to bail. And you just got to move on. And and you tell the kids, hey, you know, I thought this was going to turn out great. And it's not. And they probably know it, too. And they're not going to really be upset that you're kind of just bailing on, on what you had planned on possibly doing for for a few days. Well, it's almost like I mean, I know we talk about your student centered classroom. I, I feel like you you were often well prepared and you also think well on your feet. But there's an element that you get to turn it around on kids like, oh, it's not going how 
I wanted to kids figure out a solution. So mm-hmm. it is kind of built in that that might be more so um, a leverage point from your end. Um, but I, I guess transitioning into our conversation tonight, I know this is usually your lead in, but we have Rose Griffin uh, on and she has at least in the 69 other episodes that I've been a part of, it's slightly less than that, but I'll, <laughs> I'll say 69, 70 episodes, you know, this that is I've the first that you've been a part of. This is the first time that I felt like we talked to someone specialized in a very specific area whose life passion has gone into a a tunnel of very need and worthwhile kids in our classroom. And I love what she said early on is she finds solutions for kids that no one has really found solutions for. And I know that's not exactly how she said it, but she is just, you know, that bridge that uh, it's kind of like a closer in baseball, right? She is the one that comes in to take care of business. And um, whether it's in the the public setting or like in her, her classroom position as a speech therapist or, you know, a private role of just advocating for kids and guiding parents and teachers to deal with a population that frankly is not going away and uh, has a real distinct influence on the flow of our classroom. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. And, and um, you know, like you said, I think you illustrated that really well, that she was very specialized and very knowledgeable and it could have easily, the conversation could have easily been so specialized that it would only help a speech therapist listening to this or a speech pathologist. But the way she illustrated strategies and techniques and just general practice that you can do with your general education classroom and your, and your students, I think it was fantastic the way that she presented it to us. And, you know, just, she has, little these little nuggets where it's like just a way to talk to a student or the way to approach a conversation or the way to try to form an initial relationship that every single teacher every single administrator can listen to this and probably form a better bond with students like this tomorrow and de-escalate situations proactively because you have you've set these foundational strategies and relationships in place with these students so uh, whether or not you're a speech pathologist or you're a general education teacher, you teach art, you teach music, you teach high school, you teach elementary school, you are going to find incredible value from this conversation because of the knowledge that Rose offers in such a practical, simple way for us to listen to. So without any further delay, let's jump into that interview with Rose Griffin. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. Hi, Rose. Welcome to the Powered Up Podcast. How are you doing tonight? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We're super excited to jump in this conversation with you. So to kick things off, please officially introduce yourself. Let us know where you're coming from and give us a snapshot of your career in and related to education. Absolutely. So my name is Rose Griffin. I am a speech language pathologist and a BCBA, which stands for Board Certified Behavior Analyst. And I have worked in the public schools for 20 years. And I have also divided my time. I've had an interesting career where I've been able to work three days a week in a public school and then divide my time between now my own business, ABA Speech. But prior to that, I worked in non-public programs serving students who have autism and behavioral barriers. And that's what I specialize in. So as a former fifth grade teacher, I I now serve it as as an instructional coach, but during my time teaching fifth grade and even when I taught second grade, I would have students that would have a speech IEP. They would have their speech times usually once or twice a week. And they were very good of, you know, Mr. My speech now they would leave, they would come back. And to be perfectly honest, I knew what their goals were. I knew some of the things that they were working on, but I had absolutely no idea what they were doing at any time during that class. So just give us a snapshot of what does a speech class look like? Maybe, you know, very 
primary age versus upper elementary or middle school. Just kind of what does that time look like when you're working with one student or even a small group of students on their on their speech goals? Absolutely. So for school-based therapy, speech therapists really specialize in either helping students with their speech, which is just like you said, helping students with their speech sounds. So maybe you have a student that's not able to say the R sounds. So we would be talking about proper placement of your articulators, where's your tongue go, practicing that in words and phrases, sentences, conversation. And then speech therapists also help out with language. So that could be understanding language, following directions. And it is going to differ from students who maybe you're getting a little resource support um, with an intervention specialist uh, versus a student who is more impacted by their disability. So maybe a student who is in more of a self-contained classroom. And so they may be working on just trying to find a way to communicate and maybe they're going to not have verbal speech and maybe they're going to use an augmentative communication device, which might look like an iPad uh, with a software on it. And up through uh, older students where I, that's what I do now is I work with middle school and high school students. And so I work with students on vocational skills, understanding communication within that setting. And I also have some students with selective mutism, uh, stuttering is another thing that we do. So in a public school, we see anybody who has a communication barrier that's adversely impacting their academic performance. As a uh, former graduate, I guess, of speech and language uh, therapy uh, in elementary school, um, sometimes it comes out uh, very clearly that I was receiving services as an elementary student. Can you kind of just talk about what that spectrum looks like in the sense of obviously you have an intake and, and a kid gets uh, qualified for a need in a certain area. What do you uh, mark? You know, we spend a lot of time looking at observable and measurable goals as classroom or IEP based goals. What does that look like in the speech and language realm? Are there similarities or are there differences? Yeah, absolutely. So we definitely from the, you know, IEP, once a student is identified as needing specialized instruction in the area of communication. So if we're working with a student on speech sounds, we might set a goal that let's say that you're having trouble making your K sound. So we would say, okay, so-and-so is going to produce the K sound in isolation, in the beginning and in middle of single words with 90% accuracy over two consecutive sessions. And then we would, if it was speech sounds, we would probably, if the student was able to sit and attend, we would probably do a lot of trials to practice getting the proper placement for that. Versus a student who might be working on, let's say I have an autistic student who's in eighth grade and they're working on following two-step directions in the large school environment. So I might have a student who I say, okay, can you go to the library and make me five copies of this? So we would be working on following two-step directions that are simulated types of vocational opportunities. And then I would be taking data on that goal with prompting level. So how many prompts did the student need to complete that two-step direction? Thinking that I want to build that learner's capacity to be independent in the larger school environment, which for some kids can be really difficult, um, orienting to different places, and then independently following those directions just like they would on a job site. Can I just follow up on that real quick? Yeah. So, you know, uh, so I was a learning support teacher for a few years. And as I was transitioning, at least into the regular ed, at least our special ed department had a huge rise in identification of executive functioning skills. What you're saying as language, you know, I could also justify as being uh, a learning support teacher's uh, kind of area of focus or even emotional or autistic support um, teacher's focus as well. What about what you just shared uh, as, you know, two-step directions or, you know, the completion of task? What about that is specified to, you know, speech and language? Or is it a, hey, here's a general life skill that all of you are putting hands into to just help a kid be more functional? 
Yeah, that's a great question because I work very closely with my teachers. And so you bring up a great point. So I always say what happens in the speech room does not stay in the speech room. And really, as the kids get older, I say the real communication happens outside of the therapy room. So that's why I use that like larger school environment. Um, so that brings up a great point. For some students, I definitely have classroom teachers. Like today, I did a small group in the classroom. I was using the smart board and the teacher was there to help prompt students that needed that support. So it definitely is all about collaboration. And that's something I do a lot of training on. I'm putting together a new course for advanced language learners who are autistic. And I actually just finished the module today talking about creating shared goals. So let's say, Matt, that you were a teacher and I was a speech therapist in your building. We would maybe have separate goals, but we might have one that's shared and maybe it's a, a cooperative leisure goal. And so I'm working on it when I see the kids for small group and then you're supporting it and training the para pros and maybe they're doing it one day a week during a special like uh, unstructured time that you have in the classroom. And so we really are doing it together. And the speech therapist is kind of the director of those goals. How, how do you find you're, you're creating success and building momentum with that collaboration piece? Because I think that is a thread that is so important uh, throughout, whether it's you know me supporting the music teacher, the learning support teacher, the autistic support teacher. You know, I think, and we've said this multiple times, especially recently, we've had um, an ESL teacher and a, a special ed teacher as our, as our previous guest the last couple of weeks. And we constantly talk about the collaboration piece between the regular ed teacher and all of the, you know, I don't want to say the other teachers, but the ones that aren't the primary teacher for that student. And those systems being in place are important, but it's also, and, and you're referencing it here with that shared goal, I think it's so important when students actually see the two teachers collaborating because they realize that there is a team supporting them. So what are ways that you've found time or you've created time or you've created efficiencies in your communication with your team members to create the time to develop these shared goals and to collaborate because that's always our biggest our biggest deficit the thing that we battle most as as teachers regardless of what we do is we don't have enough time so what are some of your strategies for that Absolutely. So, you know, I have worked in the same district for 10 years. So, you know, something that I used to do a long time ago pre-COVID is that like once a year I would do a talk at a staff meeting about like speech therapy or about autism and just so people could get to know me because I think that it's all about building rapport. And I always say the most important part of my job is actually not the therapy. It's actually the collaboration with everybody because when we have more of a really condensed focus on something that's very, very important for the learner, we're going to see a lot more progress and growth. Um, and I think inherently the district that I work in, we have a time four times a week, the teachers meet for team time. And so one period out of every um, day, they are meeting at grade level teams. That's what they do at the middle school. So at the middle school, it's super easy for me to say, hey, can I come into team? And twice a month, I usually go in and I discuss the students who are receiving IEP service. Um, and another thing that I do is a lot of the kids have goals where I might see them in the therapy room, but then I'm also pushing into the classroom. And I may like just be, I really pretend I'm not even in the classroom because it's middle school. So I sit in the back corner and like am on my laptop. But I think that's building rapport with the teacher too, because I know what's going on in the classroom. I'm there to answer questions and to be a support. And that has really, really been nice. Now, when I work at the high school, it's a lot harder because those teachers meet together in grade level. They meet together in departments, so it's not grade level anymore. So when I have a student at high school, which I don't have as many students at high school, I usually am communicating via email um, because it just seems to be easier to hit all those different teachers because they don't ever get together and meet. So high school does get a little bit harder to collaborate. And obviously, they're kind of bouncing around and having you know so many responsibilities, so many kids. Um, that that collaborative time, I think, is used in many ways. And and I, I love what you just said of just being in the room. And, and even if you're commiserating about how a class went, just, hey, I'm a teacher, you're a teacher, we understand uh, that person thought it was a good idea to do that at that time, right? That is how you build those connections and build comfort. Diving a little bit further, just again, maybe for my own interest sake, you know, 
one of the things that I am always fascinated by, I guess, is two ends of the spectrum. First off, exiting from speech and language, what that looks like, um, because it almost seems like, you know, uh, if it's a functional skill, I know for like occupational therapy, if it's legible, if they're able to do generally to that level, if it's appropriate for their age, then it's kind of a judgment call. So exiting... And then the other end of things is when you recognize that maybe speech and language is not enough services, um, that there's there's obviously, you know, a bigger need. How are you feeling like in both ways you're an advocate for kids? Yeah, that's a really good question because working with middle school and high school students, I'm trying to think who has graduated recently. I feel like more the scenario is if you get to middle school, it's not that this is something you're always going to have. But what I may do for a student, like I've actually just done this this week where I had a student who is really transitioning to a um, more of the general education curriculum and he had some social skills needs. It was an autistic learner, but he's been doing great this year. And honestly, when I saw him in in speech, I was like, I don't know. You know, your teachers say you're doing great. I've seen you in class. So you really don't have anything to work on. Um, but he's a nice kid. And so we just recently had his IEP. And so what I've recommended is consult. Okay. So I will be there to support the teachers. And so what I write on those IEPs is, is that the speech therapist will meet with the team of teachers at the start of the year. And then on, at an as needly part of the team, should I did basis throughout the year so that I'm definitely need to be. Um, so that's more the case um, from services um, for somebody that um, is kind of like, we, you know, and then what was the other question that you asked? Oh, if, if you need more. Okay. So that's a good question. Okay. So yeah, there's definitely um, students I've had where we have guidance involved. Now, this is just speaking as a middle school, high school therapist. So my district has guidance counselor, and we also have um, a social worker as well um, that we contract with, like more for mental health services. And so we definitely have um, utilized those services as well. So if a student really is struggling behaviorally, um, we may say, you know, to the psychologist and open up the IP and say like, you know, we really need to have like an FBA done to look at the behaviors of this student. Um, we really think that, um, maybe we need an outside BCBA. I am a BCBA, but I get paid as a speech therapist, so I don't do FBAs or anything like that. Um, and so we really just kind of open up the document and try to collaborate and get the student what we think is going to help them be successful. That makes sense. And FBA, functional behavior analysis, where you kind of, you know, examine the different behaviors that are happening, what might have been the trigger, what did the student get out of that behavior. Um, it's a fascinating document that when you take time to actually look at it, and you're, you, you can often, you know, figure out very quickly the trigger. And for us on that instructional side, you know, we want kids to be in the classroom and participating. If we can you know, structure the classroom for success. It is a super, super helpful um, document that is, again, more fluid in your, your line of work. I guess just kind of talking, so I'm an elementary teacher. And so in middle school and high school, you know, maybe exiting is a little bit different, but I always feel like when you get to that idea of consult, that it is a really um, tough thing to stay on top of. Because so much of it is, you know, as needed. And if you're in the room, you might be in the room for two or three other teachers or two or three other students as well that I forget, oh, you used to have services, especially if that IEP didn't happen yet in the school year. So I, how do you feel like that? I don't want to say how that goes, but how do you make sure that on consult is actually still supporting kids because it's so easy to prioritize what your bigger needs are. Yeah, I think just building that bond with the teachers in the building and making sure that they know who has services. Um, I also keep what I print off like a calendar. It's from um, a TPT seller. She just, I just, it's a freebie she has every year in her store. And so what I do in my like 
I'm I'm old. Okay, I'm 43. I feel like I'm older than you guys, but I'm old school. So I like I like paper and pencil data. So I have a binder and I have every student's IEP printed and I have this calendar that goes in the front of that. And so I'm always coming from this place of people saying like, oh, you didn't see so-and-so for speech. Not because anybody's ever said that to me, but just the district I work in is very affluent. And I've worked in some extremely contentious, very contentious cases where I've had data subpoenaed by lawyers and, you know, the whole thing. Um, So I just am like overly cautious. That's probably the BCBA in me, but I keep a lot of really good data. So every week I print a schedule. And if a student wasn't there or if there's an assembly, if I couldn't see them, I mark it, but then I also put it on the calendar. So let's say the student that I wean to consult and maybe maybe he's like 20 minutes a month or something like that. I make sure like if I go to team, I circle the date and I write a little note just so I have this running record. And then when progress report comes to, you know, I can report that. But consult is different because I wouldn't be reporting any type of process, progress. It's really just a good faith effort that you're going to do what the IEP says. Um, And I went to a really good talk from a, it was an ethics talk for speech therapists, but they said, you know, the IEP is, you know, this is a legal document. And I've been in some contentious cases with lawyers. And so I really understand all that and always have my whole career. But, you know, the IEP is, this is what we said we would do. This is what we signed. And so I just think that if you're professional and you're practicing ethically, that you will provide those consultative services. Those are those are really good strategies. Whether you're a speech therapist, you are occupational therapist, learning support teacher, or even just a regular teacher, that idea of keeping that data, keeping it simple but efficient, and matching your style, matching what you need to do. Like you know, as a as a regular teacher, I would do uh, like book discussions and book reviews and and writing conferencing. And I would always, I would try to find a system that was really easy for me to manage, really easy for me to maintain. But in a snapshot, I could look and say, oh, I haven't met with Matt in the last two weeks. Or, you know, it, I even had sometimes where it was just simple check marks. I just put a check mark next to them for writing conferences by unit. So I knew that I met with Matt three times or, you know, I've only met with him once. I need to, I need to prioritize meeting with him. So keeping those simple strategies, I think is, I think is really important. A couple of times you've mentioned the autistic student population. So um, I, I would love to dig in that a little bit more, what you, what you maybe do that especially supports them um, and just where you find your, your greatest asset is in supporting them. That, that holds a, a special place in my heart because they were always in my class every year as a fifth grade teacher. Um, and I loved, I just, they're just such a fun, every kid is a fun group to work with, but they're just a group that you can really see really strong growth, I feel like, out of because they have so much potential when they when they're expected to rise to higher standards. So just, you know, what are the what are the special things that you do with them or or the biggest priorities you have with those students? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the incidents right now, the CDC just came out and said it's one in 44. So it is affecting a lot of individuals. And I think the thing that I really specialize in, in what I've created my whole business uh, on at ABA Speech is helping the student who is hard to help. So that's really kind of my whole career. I've focused on, um, you know, the student who maybe is older and still doesn't have a way to communicate with the world or a student who has behavioral barriers and is hard to reach. And, um, you know, I really love specializing in helping that student. Like, where do we get started with communication. You know, this student is, you know, not attending to the task. They didn't sit for the evaluation. How do we get this student to communicate in a way that's functional? They're getting their needs met. Um, and my work in a non-public program really inspired me to focus on that type of learner. So I used to work at the Cleveland Clinic Center for Autism. Now it's called the Learner School. Um, and it was for students who had behavioral barriers, and that was their least restrictive environment, was this specialized program. And so, you know, I remember meeting a student that was 18. It was my colleague's student, and he had no way to communicate besides using very unsafe problem behavior that was a barrier to him just being in the community at school. 
Um, and she was able to teach him to use uh, an AAC device, which it wasn't an iPad. It was just like a static device. He pressed it and it said a word and there were many buttons on there. Um, and I just remember thinking like, oh my gosh, this kid is 18 and he's never had someone that could teach him to do this. And I, it just made me feel dead inside. But it also really inspired me to create my whole business. Um to help professionals know how to help that kind of learner. Because what happens sometimes, especially, you know, it, let's say you're in a rural district or you're in a district where you've never seen a kid like that who's autistic and has high support needs, you really may not know how to teach that student. They're not going to respond to traditional intervention like we learned in graduate school. So I try to really help support speech therapists at large and how to reach that student because every student deserves a voice and sometimes people really just don't know how to reach those types of kids. Can you kind of, again, I, I don't mean to give away all the secrets or, or dive too deep. You know, what you're saying sounds incredible and, and so meaningful and to give a voice to a, a student or multiple students that, you know, haven't probably have brilliance inside that just wasn't able to share it outside of their, their skin. But it almost sounds like being a good behavior uh, management teacher is just doing right things by kids. It's really difficult to define. So what is that process? What goes into, you know, they've obviously probably come in contact with many great educators that were you know, not successful at unlocking it. What about what you do or maybe philosophy or strategy that you feel like you're able to to break through and make that meaningful connection? Yeah. Well, I think it's just that, Matt, is you have to start with a meaningful connection. You know, I mean, that's exactly what it is. So, you know, for younger students and even older students, it's all about connection before communication. So that just means being in that learner space and finding out what they really love and enjoy and being a part of that and and not being a demandful person. You know, sometimes people don't understand that, you know, asking and bombarding a kid with a ton of questions, especially a kid who doesn't talk on their own yet, is really, really not the right thing to do. So, you know, let's say I have like a farm toy and I'm in a kindergarten class and I have an autistic learner, I'm not going to go in and say like, oh, what color is the farm? What's the pig say? What animal is this? That's all wrong. I'm just going to go in and say, oh, hey, you have a farm? Cool. Look, I have a cow. It says moo. Here you go. You know, it's just like a totally different mindset. I think some people just don't understand that by trying to make that time really language enriched by asking those questions and doing all that, that is really um, not the way to connect with the students. So just like you said, it's all about connection before communication. So this idea of shared activities. So when kids are younger, we might call that joint attention. It means I'm doing something, you're doing something, and we're both focused on it together. And so that might be reading a story together or singing a song together or playing with a toy. And then as students get older, you know, I might be looking at an iPad app together or taking a walk outside together. So that's really where it all starts is that type of engagement. And so having that student want to spend time with you, and I think I just genuinely <laughs> love autistic people and want to help um, support them and think that everybody should have a voice. And, you know, I think people are well-meaning, Matt, but I think some people just don't have the training and don't have the education. And then when a student engages in a problem behavior, you know, that therapist gets, honestly, they get nervous and they feel overwhelmed and they feel like, well, I don't want to see so-and-so because last time you know, he, he hit me or last time he like threw my book across the table and I don't know what to do about that. And so then the speech therapist starts to feel bad because they don't feel like their students making progress and wh what to do an in intervention feels like a mystery because they couldn't sit through the test to, to, to do the test. And so they don't know where to start. And so then it's like this really kind of negative cycle. And so it can just be hard for, for both people involved. I think what you just said about that farm analogy, the, the two sides, that was one of the most eye-opening things that that I feel like I could have heard because it makes total sense for a student that struggles to communicate when you're bombarding them with you're not you're not intentionally doing it, but you're bombarding them with questions that they 
they might not be able to answer at all, or they're trying to think of the answer to the first one, and then you're already on the second, you're on the third, versus that comparison. And and just reflecting back on students that I've worked with, even recently, you know, as a, a coach, I'm usually in the middle schools and high school. The one day I had to <clears throat> cover a class for one of the autistic classes in the high school. It was the end of the day where they kind of just wrap up, they pack up their stuff, they make sure their homework written down, then they can play some games. And that I ended up playing, um, oh, what game did I play? I ended up playing uh, checkers with one of the students. And I felt like I had an amazing bond with this kid that I had never met before after 15 minutes. And what you just said made me realize why I did, because I didn't really ask him any questions. We just sat there and we played checkers together and we had a blast together. Um, so, you know, I think that's, that is such a valuable thing to consider. And even outside of that population of students, just your students that are shy or timid when you're trying to form those relationships, bombarding them with questions, you know, is, is definitely going to overwhelm them. So I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you. Can you give us another great idea or strategy like that, that can, we can use to, you know, create that bond with, with students? Yeah. I mean, I think another thing too, like if you have autistic learners, like not, you know, if you say hi, don't expect them to say hi back. Like every kid is going to socialize on their own terms, you know? So just kind of being in their space. And just like you said, like you were just playing a game with them. You know, sometimes I work with students who have high support needs. So a big part of what I talk about on all my platforms is modified leisure. So, you know, one example is I like to play Uno with the kids because that's a game that is very affordable and people probably have in their house so they could generalize it. And so what I do for my students Students who um, have more severe autism is I may take out all the special cards like the wilds, the draw two, skip reverse. And then I just put out a green card, a yellow card, a blue card, and a red card on the table. And then I shuffle the pile and then we pick from the main pile and we just match by color. So it's just like a very small modification, but you can see how that really allows another student to be able to engage. And just like you said, the, the student you were with could play checkers, but if you had a student who um, had high support needs and would never be able to play checkers and do the strategy, then something like this modified Uno would be like a really nice thing that you could do to connect with your students. So that's one of the most popular um, video models, which is just showing you how to play that on my YouTube channel at ABA Speech. So I, I, I don't want to... I kind of want to use what you've said, and I hope that this doesn't lead to a repetitive question. <laughs> okay. But, um, and, and if it does, please tell me it, it is, and that's okay. Um, you know, we as teachers, regardless of what role, you know, you're talking about, you know, you see a kid respond and not feel comfortable to go to a, a location or more comfortable with you, you know, Ken in fifth grade or now in his coach role, me in my fourth grade, or even learning support prior self, you know, we always feel responsible to figure out a way that we can productively help students as much as possible. You know, it, it's our responsibility, even though it's our kids, we all feel responsible. And so I guess whether it's the autistic population or, you know, speech and language or behavior based, what is something general strategies that you would say you walk into a classroom and you recognize that this is a really good environment for whatever kid because we've all heard you know a, a good teaching practice for uh, a student with autism or a student in speech and language or learning support or gifted even is probably just a good teaching practice so what are items in classrooms you've seen that you're like oh my goodness i wish all my kids kids could go through this class or what are the those kind of signs that you say if only this teacher created this structure or a visual schedule or this type thing that you recognize, hey, this teacher is going to make, going to have the best chance to make as much impact as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, you, you said one of the things, which is structure. I think structure is very, very important. Um, I haven't always, but I work with a really amazing teacher right now who, um, prior to working in the public school, she used to work in a non-public program. So she is she just learned a really great way to run her classroom. So her classroom is very, very structured. And so the students know what to expect. 
All the staff coming in to provide services know what to expect. So that type of structure is really, really important. The other thing I think that she does is everybody in the classroom, and let's see, she has, I think, four paraprofessionals. There's a lot of students in the class. So those paraprofessionals all have a schedule, and they all know what student they're helping to support what they do during that time, and where they need to be. So there's no question. And I think when we have, and it's not to say that we can't have unstructured time because even her unstructured time is teaching the kids either to play a game or they're on their iPads doing something independently, which is completely age appropriate at that age. And so I think that idea of structure and that idea of organization and having that ability to organize staff and train staff on what happens in the classroom setting a tone for the classroom, and um, just the way that the staff interacts together is really, really positive, which sets a tone (laughs) for everybody. So I really appreciate that. So those are things that really make up a great classroom. Yeah, that's really helpful. Can you can you um, shed light on you? You mentioned your personal business. Can you just shed light on to more about you know what you're doing um, aside from the couple things that you mentioned and and who it benefits and and um, and just how it's impacting education. Absolutely. So I have a company called ABA Speech, and it it started all because I had an idea for the Action Builder Cards, which is a hundred set of flashcards. And I got a designer, a distributor to sell them. I sell them on Amazon, my website. And then from that, I just started a blog, which is weekly free content. And I offer courses um, for professionals and parents about how to help autistic learners start communicating. And something that's really amazing is that I have a podcast too called Autism Outreach. And a new episode drops every single Tuesday. And I have autistic individuals on. I have autism moms. I have speech therapists, BCBAs. Um, I feel like I haven't had a teacher on yet, so I need to put that on the list. I have a running document. Good. Glad you guys, I met you guys. Um, <laughs> and so we talk all about autism and communication. And one of the things I'm super proud of is that, you know, I've been able to, um, a, a very large CEU provider where speech therapists need to get, you know, continuing education units um, has purchased some of our podcast episodes. And so they're reaching a lot um, of people just by my website, but this has really amplified the information that we're sharing that what's so cool about the business is that, you know, when I'm helping one speech therapist, it's not going to just help her current caseload or his current caseload. It's going to help all the students that they see across their career. And so being able to have that type of impact uh, is something that really lights me up and something I'm super excited to be able to do. If you're looking for a guest, uh, Matt, maybe you know his name. And before the show, Rose, we were talking about your visit to Philadelphia. There's oh. a, a, um, he's, he's probably in his mid twenties, I would guess a, a gentleman who, who does have autism, who he does, he raises awareness. He does fundraising for autism. I don't know what specifically he does, but he's very tied to the, he's very closely tied to the Philadelphia Eagles. He was like a mega Philadelphia Eagles fan. They somehow found out about him and he does fundraisers. He's involved in Philadelphia Eagle activities. I'll have to, I'll have to try to find to try to look yeah. him up. I'm, name, I'm pretty sure he's actually been on Ellen. Um, are you talking Geo the podcaster? I don't I don't know if he has a podcaster or not. Geo Geo has some disabilities. I I don't know the autistic uh, connection, but no, I think it that would be a great route. Absolutely. Maybe Eagles and autism. I'll Google it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Jeff, I'll, I'll try to find it afterwards too and and shoot it over. Not, to not you. that as really soon matters. as I as soon as I see a picture of him, I'll know who it is. Well. I'll just add, you know, like uh, autism in general has grown in its, you know, pop- popularity of support. And as you mentioned, one in every 42 children born, it is becoming something that is, you know, not as obscure using Eagles as a reference, right? The Eagles number one uh, uh, donation every year, they do an Eagles autism challenge. So all year long they're doing because the owner has uh, children with autism, Jeffrey Lurie, but it is just a, a really cool you know, I, I guess the last thing, at least I, I want to ask before I could go into many different things, but, you know, so much about autism uh, is unknown and we can understand as a spectrum that it's in this realm of, you know, you can be nonverbal to very high functioning 
and that it's really difficult. And, you know, it almost feels like, hopefully this is not an inappropriate thing to say, that, you know, everyone classifies uh, having ADD or ADHD tendencies Um, Whereas, you know, communications, the idea of people, you know, casually using, oh, they must have some spectrum of autism gets thrown away in almost a disrespectful way. Um, Where do you kind of feel like, you know, part of the identification of 41 and 44 is because we understand the warning signs or the different markers that it would take to classify as the spectrum of autism. What are you feeling is the current status, the ecosystem? You know, we have businesses that are way more welcome and having workers and, you know, creating a life that actually supports um, this population that has many gifts beyond, you know, the nineties associating all, all, people with autism to be Rain Man or, or any of these, you know, generalizations. So where, where do you feel like is the current status of autism, you know, that identification and what would be your hope for us learning more about it, supporting more about it and really goals that we can have for someone uh, in that autistic spectrum? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think my goal for every student that I have and every, you know, autistic person is that they will have a way to spontaneously communicate with the world and that they will have things that they love to do for leisure, you know, and that they will have some type of competitive employment. I think that's really what our hope is for everybody to have an enriched life and have relationships that are very important. And I think that, you know, it really depends, I feel like, on where you live. Like I live in the Cleveland area. Area. And, you know, I'm not, an, I don't have autistic children, but I am a provider. And I do feel like in my area, we do have a lot of really rich services. You know, we have um, sensory friendly story times and sensory friendly plays and all of those amazing things. And I actually just had a really amazing um, uh, speech therapist who owns a business on my podcast. Her episode aired what day is today? Today. And um, she said they actually moved her entire family from New York to Florida um, when COVID hit because everything in New York was completely virtual and her son really, really needed that structure. And they really did their homework and they found an amazing support for him and a specialized school. And she moved her entire family to a different state, which is like she moved from where she was from, where she had family. Um, But it's been a really good move for her son and for her family. They've made it that way. And I really do think it has a lot to do with your region. So, you know, something that I do is like, I always say, you know, I wake up and I disseminate like April, like when we're taping this is autism acceptance month. But I always say, I just said on my Instagram story, you know, I have like 21,000 followers and I said, you know, I don't really do all too many things different during April because every day to me is a day to disseminate about autistic individuals. And so I think really if you have somebody in your family who's a loved one um, with autism is just being an advocate for them. And, you know, making sure that, you know, if you have a bad experience in a, you know, Target or somewhere because some, you know, maybe your child does have a behavioral uh, meltdown or a behavioral barrier or a moment, um, you know, really trying to try to remain calm, um, but try to really advocate for what is autism and how can we as neurotypical people um, be considerate, uh, uh, you know, of how autistic uh, individuals are operating because I think it, it's on both sides. So I just really try to share that information and um, I feel like I'm trying to do my part uh, that way. You surely are. That's incredible. That's that's really great. I, I definitely want to tune into to some of these shows to, to learn more about that. And I did find who I was talking about. Um, <clears throat> his, his website is benergy1.com. So Ben and energy combined, but there's not a not a, a double N or double E in there, or whatever it would be. But he does motivational speaking, and he's he's got a really cool story. So um, it, it would definitely be interesting for you to look into. I think it would be a be a fun show for you and a fun yeah, connection. I love that. So I do want to transition into our lesson lens, where we try to learn and dig into something that you've done specifically with students. It can be one of your uh, small group lessons, individual, something you've done to support with a teacher, wherever you want to take us on this journey, that is totally fine with us. So question number one, um, I guess I'm going to modify it slightly. Are we going to look at a single 
uh, pull out lesson for speech or something that you've done um, embedded in the classroom of the teacher? Uh, I small group lesson in the classroom okay. is what I had in mind. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, when so the- I had, do, do you want me to answer what, oh. what the lesson was exactly? We have some rapid fire questions to. Okay. To okay. Go totally ahead. Okay. I'm no, ready. you're, you're totally good. <laughs> so, um, if you were to kind of classify kind of, if it was grade level specific, maybe, you know, subject area, if there, there was a focus behind it, or maybe if it was related to a specific time of year. So it was a vocational lesson. So I would consider it more life skills. Okay. Was it anything like, was it, hey, I need to do this at the beginning of the year, middle or end of the year? No, it could be done at any time. Yeah. And any specific group of students, is it uh, a grade level specific? Uh, It was not. It could be for six, seven, eight, middle school. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. What were the objectives of the lesson? So this is a lesson that I co-taught, uh, co-treated with the occupational therapist. And so I covered vocabulary about vocational, a vocational unit and the occupational therapist. We worked on extension activities. So we were talking about working in a clothing store and then we were practicing hanging shirts and using one of those really cool folding boards like they do at Old Navy. Mm, that's awesome. Yes, it was very fun. So when looking just specifically at what you're asking the students to do, what were some of their activities during that lesson? So we read a passage together, um, students that were able to uh, read, and then we also labeled vocabulary that was from that unit. And then um, from the OT, she was demonstrating how to do certain skills, like they would, uh, like a simulated vocational activity. And then the students were um, completing that skill after that model from the clinician. That's awesome. That's really cool. I, I love the collaboration with the, the occupational therapist. What was was your role and the occupational therapist's role to ensure the student success during the lesson? Um, yeah. So we were just there to model. We definitely had, you know, what we were doing in the lesson was tied to IEP goals. So we were, you know, the students were doing them with independence. And then if they needed a prompt, we were going in and, you know, trying to systematically fade that and just kind of take data on what supports they needed during that time. So this is the last question, and then you can continue to elaborate as you would like. But um, as you went through that lesson, you know, we always reflect and we say, hey, I'd love to change or adjust or extend in certain ways. Um, it Was there something that next time you're teaching it, you'd want to bring in to make it more real world or have a bigger impact? No, I mean, I think the lesson went really well. And so I just, I don't get to collaborate with that OT as much anymore. Um, And so I would love to just do it again, because I think that type of speech therapy and OT collaboration is really, really powerful. Yeah, it really brings, brings both goals to a point that are, that are aligned in the, in the same direction. So I think that's, that's really neat. And just collaboration amongst teachers is always is always beneficial so our last section of the show is called the exit ticket same four questions we ask every guest every week question number one what is the best thing a teacher can do to make a student's school experience better i think just being positive and building a rapport with the student i think that's huge it's all about relationships perfect So thinking about advice, what is the best piece of advice that you have received? And it could be from a colleague, a supervisor, or even a student. Mm, that's a really good one. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, a. I think this is more my business, but you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint, right? You know, actually Gary V, you guys probably know who Gary V is because of where you live. Okay. Like definitely into the Gary V show. And he just said, you know what, with wine library or whatever he talked about, you know, at first his first business, you have to talk about something for 10 years before people realize that you're talking about it. So I'm on year five. I've been able to grow my business. Um, but I really love Gary V's, um, thoughts on things. And, uh, I really took that to heart. So, you know, I'm here on this podcast now, which has really been so much fun. Um, but I really just disseminate share every single day, not because, you know, obviously I want to build my business, but, um, I like that idea of helping people too, um, and, and helping my family and serving others. So, you know, definitely that, um, 
I'm in year five, so you know I got to keep it going. But I've really embedded my business and what I do is just a part of my life. So you know I have a lot of helpers in my business. I'm not like going to burn out or anything, but I do love that idea of when I get down or you know when I've had a great success. I think about Gary Vee saying like you know you got to be talking about something for ten years before people realize that you're out there. So yeah. And I also think it's easy in our line of field when things do get tough that when you zoom out a little bit and you recognize the impact, it's really easy to ignite and remember why you're doing it. So fantastic. I I would not listen to Gary Vee while you're at school or at work, but uh, <laughs> right. yeah. he is a fan, fantastic <laughs> person. And I think his, yeah. his belief is great. So um, we, you know, as the classroom side of things, I'm sure you have very much similar items. Um, but we deal with, you know, waves in education, you know, there are lighter times, there are re really crazy intense times for our ends, it might be, you know, conferences, report cards, yours might be preparing for an IEP, or unfortunately, litigation, those type things. Yeah. Um, what is something you feel like you could share to educators or people that work with students to help them power up through those moments of struggle? Yeah, I would just say trying to build a rapport with parents and, you know, not every parent is going to be your bestie, is going to be your best friend. You may not see eye to eye with everybody, but I think if you things keep things professional and if you definitely try to keep the line of communication open, that that's really all that you can do and that you know you've done your best. And, you know, I like my brother said growing up, like you could be like the best apple in the bunch, but, you know, you might meet somebody that doesn't like apples. They think they're disgusting. So not everybody's going to like you. And that's just how it is. They might think the grass is greener on the other side. And you just have to say, I'm not going to take this personally. And once you've been doing this for so long and you interact with so many people, like I always say, the best part of my job is I get to interact with people. And the worst part of my job is I get to interact with people. So, I mean, it's just the truth, right? I'm a people person. I love people. Um, that's why I love the podcast. But, you know, there are times that are very trying and you have to not take it personally. And I think that's just really try to keep the lines of communication open and don't take it personally. It is easy to fall into facilitating a repetitive classroom. What separates teachers who constantly seek change, innovation, and implementing new teaching strategies? Yeah. I mean, I just think trying to practice at the top of your game, like, you know, having my online business, I definitely, when I became a speech therapist, I knew I wanted to be a lifelong learner because it's a science related field. So as research comes out, you know, especially with autism, there's so many things that we've learned from the autistic community. Like, you know, we don't say red flags anymore. You know, autistic people want us to say autistic, most autistic people instead of person with autism, you know, using terms like high functioning, low functioning functioning. That's really negative. You know, we don't do that anymore. So I've really learned, you know, through my podcast and through just interacting with the autistic community, um, these things. And then obviously that feedback and research that's clinical research that all informs my practice. So I think just staying on top of professional development number one, but number two is actually just taking little moments that you can actually make a difference in your classroom with what you've learned. I think that's the hardest thing about PD is saying, okay, this was really great. Like this is an awesome software that we have access to. I'm actually going to try it in my classroom. And I think that's really what is hard as educators, but I always try to be practicing at the top of my game. Um, and it doesn't always have to be new. I definitely have tried and true things that I'm doing, but you know, there's always something new that I'm learning, that I'm trying with my students, that I'm taking data. Did it help them? Was it fun? Um, and I'm always trying to innovate that way. I feel like I could benefit a ton, you know, listening to your podcast and following along in your journey. And um, I think our audience could too. Can you kind of share what is the best ways to follow along and, you know, whether I don't have anyone identified with uh, autism currently in my classroom, but I think, you know, just the practices that you have spent your life dedicating um, is really helpful. How can we follow along and continue that conversation? Absolutely. So visit me at abaspeech.org. I am also on Instagram, ABA Speech by Rose, and I have my podcast, Autism Outreach. It drops every single Tuesday, and you can watch it on YouTube as well. So ABA Speech is kind of my handle. That's where you can find me if you Google me. 
there's just all kinds of things <laughs> about autism. So lots of good information out there. Um, and I hope that you'll give it a listen. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rose. This is this has been truly enlightening for, for me and I, I know for Matt as well. Um, we have not had a guest on our show with with this type of knowledge and experience related to speech, related to autistic students. And so it's it's been really neat to kind of dig into the weeds here and and find out what we can do to better empower those students, better support those students, and just provide a the best learning environment possible for those students to succeed. So we will link to your website and your social media handles on our show notes page, which can be found at powereduup.com slash show 70. Um, so everything will be linked there. If this is the first time you're listening to us, we encourage you to please subscribe, whether you're watching on YouTube or you're listening on your favorite podcast app. And please share this with other teachers uh, for no other benefit than the teacher themselves, because Matt and I, have engaged in the best professional development we've ever had for over a year now. And it's because we get to talk to amazing teachers, amazing, edu amazing educators, just like you, Rose. So you are definitely making a difference, not only in your school community, but a, an audience at a, a much, much larger scale. So thank you for doing that. And please keep doing that to provide the best opportunity for these students. So thanks again for joining us, Rose. And Mr. Rogers, why don't you shut us on down here? All right. As we powered down this episode, Rose, you left us feeling powered up. Uh, everyone stay well, keep on digging in and make the last few weeks of school as great as possible. The kids deserve it. We'll talk to you next week.